If you hear the dogs, keep going. If you see the torches in the woods, keep going. If they're shouting after you, keep going. Don't ever stop. Keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, keep going. Attributed to Harriet Tubman, although possibly apocryphal. Hillary Clinton used this quote as a metaphor in her speech at the 2008 Democratic National Convention and continued to do so during her 2016 presidential campaign, while the administration that she worked for had been hunting people with dogs every single day for eight years. I take the message more literally. No Wall They Can Build, A Guide to Borders and Migration Across North America. Episode 6, The Border. The Border. As a physical space, you could visualize the U.S.-Mexico border as a zone demarcated by three lines of control, extending east to west from Brownsville, Matamoros, to San Diego, Tijuana. The southern line, usually well inside of Mexico, is wherever it becomes necessary to pay someone to pass. There is not one inch of the border that is not spoken for by somebody. Even crossing without a guide means paying a large fee to whatever combination of mafia and the government patrols the southern side. It is not advisable to attempt to avoid paying this fee. The central line is the international boundary. The northern line, 25 to 50 miles inside of the United States, is at the interior checkpoints. These are places where Border Patrol stops and inspects all vehicles on major roads. They profile passengers based on skin color first and English fluency second. Anyone who looks brown is going to have to demonstrate good English. Some people without papers who look brown and speak English well can bluff their way through. However, anyone who looks brown and doesn't speak English well is going to get asked for papers. Anyone who looks brown, doesn't speak English well, and doesn't have papers, is going to get taken in. So, to cross the border, you have to be granted passage through the southern line, cross the boundary line, and then get all the way past the northern line to a place where it's possible to be driven to safety in a vehicle. In some cities and towns, the southern line collapses onto the central line at the border wall. This occurs in places where it's impossible to cross the international boundary. So, you don't have to pay anyone off to get to the city of Nogales, but you can't cross the wall there either. If you want to get out into the desert where you can cross the boundary line, someone has to be paid. The northern line extends the whole length of the United States. It's never easy and usually very difficult to get away from the border on the American side without driving through a checkpoint. There are two main sets of migration routes. The northwestern routes are in Sonora and are controlled by the Sinaloa cartel. These are also the main routes for overland marijuana smuggling. The northeastern routes are in Tamaulipas and controlled by the Gulf Cartel. The latter is a former rival and current ally of the Sinaloa and appears to be doing business on a similar model. In Sonora, the business of human trafficking and marijuana smuggling is so closely interlinked that it is simplest to discuss it as a single operation. The two main sets of routes share those basic characteristics, but otherwise are completely different. The northwestern routes traverse basin and range topography, picturesquely described by Clarence Dutton as an army of caterpillars marching towards Mexico. These routes change elevation abruptly as they alternate between rugged mountain ranges and arid basins. It is usually bone dry. The winters are quite cold, and in the summer it is a blazing furnace. The entire space between the southern and northern lines of control is wild and uninhabited desert. Most of the American side is public, tribal, or military land. The northeastern routes traverse flat, sandy scrublands. It is usually very humid, and in the summer it is swelteringly hot. The central line of control is the Rio Grande. It passes through the metropolitan areas of the River Valley. Huge cattle ranches occupy the space between the central and northern lines. Nearly all of the American side is private land. There is no need to describe every migration corridor in the country in detail. People cross everywhere. However, it's worth spending some time on the places where the most deaths occur, southern Arizona and south Texas. The most heavily traveled part of Arizona can be broken into three subcategories. The eastern routes, traversing a hodgepodge of public land jurisdictions, 
are between the Atascosa Mountains and the Babokivari Mountains. They are at a slightly higher elevation and are slightly cooler, but they also feature the most rugged and confusing terrain. It is very easy to get lost. These places are extremely sparsely inhabited. There are far more deer and cows than people. The only place between the boundary line and the northern line of control where anyone lives is the town of Arivaca. This is where our solidarity work has been focused for many years. The central routes through Arizona, which traverse Totno Autumn tribal land, pass between the Babokavari Mountains and the Ajo Mountains. They are hotter and at a lower elevation than those around Arivaca. There are areas of the reservation that are uninhabited, but there are also many places where people live. For many years, we didn't work on the reservation. Over the last several years, we've been doing occasional search and rescue operations there, under specific circumstances and with permission from the tribal government. The western routes pass between the Ajo Mountains and the Mohawk Mountains, across a mixture of public and military land. They are lower, hotter, and even more sparsely inhabited than anywhere else. The only place where anyone lives is the town of Ajo. We started working in this area several years ago. The busiest part of Texas is in Brooks County, between McAllen and Falfurrias. Let's look at each of these places in detail. Arivaca the unlikely story of how Arivaca came to be an epicenter of efforts in solidarity with migrants and refugees is both interesting and instructive. Arivaca, Arizona is an unincorporated community of about 700 people. The population is widely dispersed across many small to medium-sized ranches. There is one bar, one store, and anywhere from three to six churches depending on the season. Maybe it would be possible to break down the racial demographics between Anglos and Latinos, or the subcultural demographics between cowboys and hippies, but Aravacans have been miscegenating in every way for so long that most of them are something in between. The place is actually wild. There is still buckshot in the doorway of the bar, where a man named Lucky accidentally blew off his arm with a sawed-off shotgun that he had stuck in his coat. No one seems to believe that Lucky had any particularly bad intentions. That was just how he rolled. Arivaca became ground zero for everything related to migration and border militarization in the years after the attacks of September 11, 2001. Border Patrol pushed traffic west out of Nogales and forced it into the remote desert surrounding Arivaca. Thousands of travelers started turning up at Arivacan's back doors in every imaginable stage of desperation. Before long, Arivaca itself became heavily militarized. Caravans of Border Patrol would roll through town at all hours of day and night loaded for bear and generally treating the place as if it were Iraq. No more deaths began to work in Arivaca in 2004. Arivaca briefly made national news in 2009. This story has been told and retold. What happened afterwards is less widely known. On May 30th, two white supremacists from the Pacific Northwest, Shauna Ford and Jason Bush, an Arivaca man, Albert Gaxiola, and a never-identified fourth party, committed double murder at the Aravaca home of Raul Jr. Flores, his wife Gina Gonzalez, their 11-year-old daughter Alexandra Flores, and their 9-year-old daughter, Brisenia Flores. Ford and Bush had been bouncing around the white supremacist and border vigilante milieu for years. Ford was an affiliate of Chris Simcox, the nationally known founder and spokesman of a succession of Minutemen militia groups. She had concocted a plan to rob cartel members in order to fund a new group, Minutemen American Defense. She enlisted the assistance of Bush, who is associated with the Aryan Brotherhood, and who is suspected to have committed two additional racially motivated murders in the state of Washington in 1997. Gaxiola led them to the Flores home. Junior Flores, by most accounts I've heard around town, was probably involved on some level in the local marijuana business, like a fair number of other people in southern Arizona. He is generally thought to have run afoul of Gaxiola, who was also involved, because of something related to this. Flores may not have been a completely law-abiding citizen, but most people seem to agree that calling him a cartel member was a pretty serious stretch. Nobody thinks he deserved what happened next. In the news, if not in Aravaca, it was usually mentioned that both Flores and Gonzalez were third-generation citizens of the United States. Ford, Bush, and Gaxiola woke the Flores family out of their sleep around 5 a.m., dressed in camouflage, wearing bulletproof vests, and claiming to be the border patrol. Alexander was sleeping away from home. 
When Flores asked them for identification, Bush shot him in the chest and shot Gonzalez in the leg. They ransacked the house but failed to find anything of value. Bush then shot Brisinia in the head. Gonzalez was able to return fire, wounding Bush, and the assailants fled. She survived and told and retold the story about the people who barged into her house in the middle of the night and murdered her husband and daughter for no reason. When this all came to light, it sent the border vigilante movement into a tailspin from which it has never recovered, and probably never will. It has since disemboweled itself. In April 2010, Chris Simcox's wife was granted a protection order after he allegedly brandished a gun at her and threatened to shoot her and their children. In June 2013, he was arrested on multiple counts related to child molestation and sexual conduct with a minor, involving three girls under the age of 10, one of whom is his daughter. Simcox was convicted of child sexual abuse in June 2016 and is serving a prison sentence of 19 and a half years. In May 2012, another Arizona border vigilante leader, Jason J.T. Reddy, shot and killed his girlfriend, her daughter, her daughter's fiancé, and her 15-month-old granddaughter before turning the gun on himself. The Minutemen have showed themselves for what they are, people looking for opportunities to inflict violence down the social hierarchy often on children. Albert Gaxiola was sentenced to life in prison plus an additional 72 years. Sean Ford and Jason Bush are on death row, looking for supporters. They have found none. Gina Gonzalez, at terrible cost, can go to her grave knowing that she fired the shots that sent this odious milieu to hell. God only knows what would have happened if her aim had been less true. It's almost impossible to overstate the impact of the Flores murders in Aravaca. Everyone knew Gina and Junior. Everyone's kids went to school with Brisenia. I was in Arivaca on the day of the killings and remained there for months afterwards. The mood in the bar was not just sorrowful, but ominous. I thought that there would be retribution. After the murders, solidarity workers like us were the only game left in town. It was clear that there was a crisis. No one could ignore it. The crisis would come to you in the form of a desperate Honduran woman knocking on your window in the middle of the night. The state had discredited itself completely by bringing on this crisis and then treating Aravaca like a war zone. The vigilantes had proven themselves to be child murderers. We had been there for five years, leaving water bottles in the desert. It was pretty clear whose side to take. As of 2016, there was a humanitarian aid office across the street from the bar. There have been repeated protests and acts of civil disobedience, at the border patrol checkpoint outside of town, and there is often a big sign that says Militias Go Home on display when you drive into the tiny Sunday farmer's market. I doubt that there is any municipality in the entire country where a higher percentage of people have acted concretely in solidarity with migrants and refugees, or where a lower percentage of people will cooperate with the border patrol if they can possibly avoid it. Solidarity workers from other places have contributed to this, but we did not lead and people from Aravaca did not follow. If anything, the inverse was true. Locals had been helping people for years before we got there. What happened was a two-way street. Locals and outsiders influenced each other. At this point, it's becoming difficult to tell the difference between the two. Neither the state nor the vigilantes have any hope of regaining the sympathies of this town. You can't put people under siege and expect them to forget. Nor can you shoot a nine-year-old girl in the face and expect to be forgiven. At this point, when people in Aravaca run into travelers in need of assistance, they are most likely to deal with it themselves or to reach out to us for help. They are not very likely to call the Border Patrol. Not in a thousand years will anyone call the vigilantes. Two ranchers live near us, El Pelon and Crazy Mark. Both Vietnam veterans, they were a study in contrast. El Pelon was as bald as a cue ball and wore a magnificent Ho Chi Minh mustache, a worthy adversary, he told me, describing the Vietnamese communist leader. He had seen heavy combat in the Marine Corps and had repeatedly been exposed to Agent Orange. He had moved to the desert after the war and had been helping migrants in distress since long before No More Deaths or any other humanitarian aid organization arrived. He gave food and water to thousands of people over the years. He liked us. I used to feed his donkeys. Crazy Mark hated us with a passion, 
He would destroy our water bottles whenever he could find them, and occasionally he would let off a couple shots in the general direction of our camp. He made it clear to me on more than one occasion that he would be just as happy to put a hot one through my head. He would go around all the time in full camouflage and reflective sunglasses. He was really damaged and actually dangerous. People were afraid of him, and justifiably so. Everyone called him Crazy Mark behind his back, although never to his face. Everyone except El Pelon. The two ranchers were close friends. El Pelon would frequently invite us over for dinner, to use a shower, or to get ice. Sometimes Crazy Mark would be there. One time he began to threaten me and one of my colleagues in lurid detail. El Pelon interrupted him. These people are my guests, Mark. They are under my protection. El Pelon's health declined precipitously. We were spending a lot of time with him. He had flashbacks and all types of nerve damage. He never slept. He wouldn't eat or drink anything except coffee, and he would stay up all night watching war movies, chain-smoking and ashing on the floor. He was taking enough morphine and oxycodone to drop a horse. We started sleeping up at his house as often as not. One night, there was a ferocious storm brewing. It was clear that it was going to rain harder than hell. It was cold. A group of seven migrants came knocking on the door. I'm sorry, senor, one of them said to El Pelon. It's going to rain. Is there anywhere we can spend the night? Yeah, El Pelon told him. Get in the barn. It's warm and dry. There's plenty of straw. We went to sleep. It poured all night with wind and thunder and lightning. First thing in the morning, we went out to look for anybody that had gotten caught in the storm. We didn't find anyone, and we went back to the house around noon to check on the migrants. Another volunteer was in the driveway. El Pelon is dead, he told me. He's in there in his bed. His dogs are freaking out. I did CPR and everything, but it's no use. I called 911 almost an hour ago. They should be out here at any moment. As soon as he had said this, we saw an ambulance and a police car in the distance, bumping up the long and rocky road towards the house. My stomach dropped. First, there were still seven migrants in the barn. Second, I was acutely aware of the fact that El Pelon's house was bursting at the seams with every kind of firearm imaginable, from ancient blunderbusses to 50 caliber machine guns and everything in between. There were a lot of ways that this could end badly. All of a sudden, Crazy Mark came roaring up next to us on his four-wheeler, seemingly out of nowhere. He wasn't wearing his sunglasses. Where's El Pelon? He sounded hoarse. I dropped my head. El Pelon is dead, Mark. I'm sorry. We looked at each other. I drew a circle in the dirt with my foot. This is me. I drew another circle that touched the first one at only one point. This is you. I twisted my foot on the point where the circle met. This is El Pelon. Even if you and I don't have a single other thing in common, we both loved him. My colleague ran to the barn to tell the migrants to stay hidden in the straw. Mark left. The paramedics drove off with El Pelon's body. The sheriff and the coroner followed them. The migrants left. Mark came back. We have to deal with the guns, he told me. He disassembled each weapon methodically, one by one. This one is okay. This one is okay. This one is a problem. The next day, a lawyer came out to the house. All of the guns were disposed of legally. The next time I saw Mark was at the memorial service in front of the house. He had his sunglasses on. At the end of the service, he did the three-volley salute with a pistol for El Pelon. Ready, aim, fire, boom. Aim, fire, boom. Aim, fire, boom. He didn't speak a word to me. The war in Vietnam ended before I was born, but it killed my friend El Pelon just the same. The last thing he ever did was shelter seven people in his barn. Mark stopped slashing our bottles. I never saw him again. Cells. The politics of migration on the Tatna Autumn Reservation are extremely complex. I am not Autumn, and I don't speak for any Autumn people. Some autumn thinkers whose analyses have been personally useful to me include Ophelia Rivas, Alex Soto, and Mike Wilson. I encourage the listener to seek out their commentary, while understanding that autumn opinions differ widely 
and sometimes directly clash. This is what I can say from my vantage point. To reiterate this, European colonists stole the land that currently makes up the border between Arizona and Sonora from its original inhabitants by means of genocide. It is autumn, Apache, and Yaqui land, occupied by the governments of Mexico and the United States. If anyone has a right to decide who can pass through autumn territory, it is autumn people, not either of those governments. There are many indigenous communities in the United States, and many southern border communities as well. But the Totano Autumn Reservation is one of the only places in the country that is truly both. That means that it not only gets the problems of Aravaca, but of Pine Ridge to boot. It's no exaggeration to say that it has been converted into a militarized police state. Autumn people are subject to rampant harassment and racial profiling on their own land, pulled out of their cars and houses left and right by Border Patrol agents fresh out of Connecticut who can't tell red from brown and couldn't tell you the difference between Cells, Arizona, and San Pedro Sula, Honduras. The border has sundered Autumn on the south side from their relatives on the north. Militarization and migration have led to the desecration of sacred sites and the disruption of ceremonies. In addition, Autumn people face the same problems as many other indigenous people in the United States. Poverty, unemployment, erosion of cultural identity, multi-generational trauma, and more. The federal government has gone out of its way to push traffic onto the Totna Autumn Reservation, out of the sight of white people. Almost every year, more people die there than on any other comparably sized section of the entire border. The government has offered up the reservation as a sacrifice zone to the border militarization, drug smuggling, and human trafficking industries, in the same way that it has offered up Black Mesa to the coal industry and Yucca Mountain to the nuclear industry just to name two of the countless examples. In all of these cases, it has found tribal leaders willing to play ball. They have turned the Autumn homeland into a death trap. The Autumn tribal government works closely with Border Patrol and forbids humanitarian aid on the reservation, taking the position that such aid would encourage more migration through Autumn land. In my opinion, this position is asinine. It is clearly the actions of the federal government that have pushed the traffic onto Autumn land and ensure that it will stay there. I do, however, recognize the federal government has put the tribal government in an impossible position. They're damned if they do, and damned if they don't. They can control what humanitarian aid organizations do, but they can't control what the Border Patrol does. I also recognize that the tribal government is not a monolithic entity. There are dissenting voices within it. More importantly, there is no shortage of autumn people acting autonomously of the tribal government. Autumn people have been at the forefront of many of the more interesting things happening in Arizona in recent years, from the May 2010 occupation of the Border Patrol headquarters in Tucson, to the December 2011 actions to disrupt the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, conference in Scottsdale, the ongoing campaign against the 202 loop outside of Phoenix, and many other examples. I've heard countless stories of Autumn people acting in solidarity with travelers passing through their land. As usual, there is no easy solution. There is no simple reform that will end the suffering on the reservation. I think it's fair to say that most Autumn people are well aware of the terrible irony. Thousands of people, including a great number of indigenous people, are dying on their homeland. I seriously doubt that many Autumn are happy about this. In my opinion, it would be a step in the right direction if the tribal government would allow humanitarian aid organizations to operate on the reservation. But if that were the only thing to change... If the federal government were allowed to continue to use the reservation as a sacrifice zone, then, yes, it's possible that this would only lead to more traffic on autumn land. The needs of undocumented people cannot be untangled from the needs of indigenous people. Ajo. This place is grim. Rocky, barren, devoid of shade, and fearsomely, ferociously hot. Some of this territory was the site of the incident of May 2001, described in The Devil's Highway by Luis Alberto Uria, when 14 people died here trying to cross near the Growler Mountains. Despite the fact that the author credulously accepts a lot of Border Patrol public relations talking points at face value, that book did draw a lot of attention to deaths on the border. Land jurisdiction along these routes is divided between Organ Pipe National Monument, Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Reserve, Bureau of Land Management, and the Barry M. Goldwater Air Force Range. 
public access to Cabeza Prieta, and especially the Barry Goldwater Range, is strictly controlled. Outside of the town of Ajo, absolutely no one lives on these routes. Many routes miss Ajo entirely. Tourists do frequent organ pipe. Very few civilians ever set foot on Cabeza Prieta, and fewer still on the Barry Goldwater. When we began to work in this area, we noticed something suspicious. Every year lots of human remains are discovered in organ pipe, but almost none in Cabeza Prieta or on the Barry Goldwater. This doesn't mean that people aren't dying there. It just means that nobody ever goes there to find out. When we started going into Cabeza Prieta and onto the Barry Goldwater, we started finding remains immediately. In addition to all the challenges I've already described, people who cross the Barry Goldwater have to contend with the fact that it's an active bombing range full of unexploded ordnance. It's possible to be blown up from above or from below. Nobody has any idea how frequently this happens. There are areas where even Border Patrol can't go. Picture this. There is a place inside the bombing range. It exists. We've heard about it more than once, but we don't know exactly where it is. It's a facsimile of a town that the Air Force has built to practice bombing. They build and destroy it perpetually. Unless people know better, they head toward this place, thinking that surely they must be in sight of something, maybe even Gila Bend. What they find is that they have wandered into the set of a movie about Stalingrad, featuring real bombs and no direction from above. This is probably the worst place on the entire border. Falfurius Brooks County in rural southern Texas is listed as the poorest county in the state and regularly makes the list of poorest counties in the entire country. It has recently seen an explosion of migrant deaths, especially of Central Americans. As in Arizona, large numbers of people are dying while trying to circumvent the Falfurius checkpoint on Highway 281. Since 2012, there have been some months where more remains have been discovered in Brooks County than on any part of the Totna Autumn Reservation of comparable size. This was previously unheard of. I am less conversant with the situation in Tamaulipas and Texas than I am with Sonora and Arizona, but I am fairly sure that I can pinpoint three basic reasons why this has happened. The first is because of border militarization in Arizona. This is usually the first factor mentioned in the American press. I believe this has had a role, but not as much as is often portrayed. In my experience, militarization in Arizona mostly serves to move traffic around Arizona itself, from one trail to another, from Aravaca to the reservation, from the reservation to Ajo, and so on. However, it is true that it's more difficult to cross there now than it was in the late 2000s. I don't doubt that some people have decided to take their chances on Texas instead. The second reason that is usually mentioned is the Border Patrol's policy change, in effect from late 2013 until sometime in 2014. As I mentioned earlier, during this time they were not immediately deporting unaccompanied Central American minors or Central American mothers with underage children. Word did get around. I was in Guatemala in early 2014, and there were flyers hanging up on telephone poles everywhere, saying things like, Senoras, it is I, Roberto, your humble and honest servant. I swear before God that I can get you and your children into the United States. No hiding in a tractor-trailer truck. No walking in the desert. Call me any time of day or night. 5867-5309. However, this doesn't explain everything. After all, the Border Patrol never stopped deporting Central American men, or women without children, and these demographics have been well represented in South Texas as well. Many, if not most, of the unaccompanied minors and women with underage children who crossed into South Texas during this time didn't try to circumvent the checkpoint. They crossed the international boundary and then sought out Border Patrol to turn themselves in. This is a very different thing, and much less dangerous. The third reason, rarely mentioned in the American press, is cartel politics on the Mexican side. The onset of the Brooks County deaths generally coincided with a series of setbacks to the Zetas. Several influential Zetas leaders were killed or captured around this time, October 2012 to October 2013, and the Gulf Cartel won back control of Reynosa, where they had been battling with the Zetas for several years. Lo and behold, shortly afterwards, large numbers of Central Americans started turning up in Brooks County. It appears to me that the Gulf Cartel put out the word in Central America, 
Okay, the adults are back in charge. You can come this way again. Call Roberto. It appears to me that there was a period after the San Fernando massacres where the human trafficking business in Tamaulipas all but broke down. Now it's business as usual, which means that people are going to die. This has created a perfect storm in South Texas. South Texas is clearly calling out for solidarity efforts. The situation there is bad. A lot of people are dying. It would be great if a campaign in solidarity with migrants and refugees took place there on a scale comparable to the one in Arizona. However, this has proven difficult. What happened in Arizona was an organic outgrowth of a particular set of conditions. It can't just be exported to Texas. For starters, there are two fundamental differences between South Texas and Southern Arizona. First, a lot of the land on which people are dying in Arizona is public, so we can operate on it freely. Practically all of the land on which people are dying in South Texas is private, so operating on it means getting the consent, if not the participation, of the owners and workers on large cattle ranches. This is possible, but it takes work. It is not the case that ranchers and ranch hands are automatically hostile to migrants or even to solidarity workers in their radical politics. Sometimes they are, but not always. In fact, this is precisely our base of support in Aravaca, which is why our organization is robust and will not be dislodged from there anytime soon. For one thing, a lot of ranchers, and especially ranch hands, are Latino. For another, even people who might otherwise be right-wing tend to soften up when they have to look death and suffering in the face. In Arizona, there is an inverse relationship between the average white person's level of empathy for migrants and the distance from the border. Aravaca is extremely sympathetic. Phoenix is extremely hostile. The second difference between South Texas and Southern Arizona is that while Southern Arizona is extremely mountainous, South Texas is completely flat. Mountains create trails, which make for lots of good places to drop supplies. In flat places, there's nothing to force people to walk one place instead of another. The best that can be done is to haul 50-gallon drums of water to various places, put blue flags on them, and hope people see them. Again, this isn't impossible but it necessitates the participation and consent of private landowners. The last complicating factor is that while it was radicals who got on the ground first in Arizona, in Texas it was not. Lacking other options to respond to the large numbers of deaths, Brooks County ranchers began organizing their own patrols to look for people. They would patrol each other's ranches, look for people in distress, and call the Border Patrol when they found them. It appears to me that this was mostly an organic response to the crisis later influenced somewhat by reactionary activists of the National Border Vigilante milieu. As mentioned before, this milieu has been completely discredited in Arizona. Honestly, the civilian patrols were probably better than nothing. They almost certainly saved lives. However, collaborating with Border Patrol in this way is something that we adamantly don't do in Arizona. We never help them apprehend people, and we never turn anybody in unless they ask us to. Maintaining an adversarial relationship with Border Patrol has helped us to curb migrant deaths, not hindered us. Being clear about our politics has allowed us to seek support in the right places and has given us credibility where we need it. On a practical level, it means that people who need help don't have to hide from us. It has also allowed us to good cop, bad cop Border Patrol when we need to negotiate. This dynamic in South Texas has been exacerbated by the fact that, if anything, Border Patrol has been better behaved there than in Arizona. Border Patrol is the problem. It can't be part of the solution. Not even if individual agents or sector chiefs try, which occasionally they do. All of that said, there are a variety of groups and individuals doing effective work in Brooks County, notably the South Texas Human Rights Center in Falfurius. If the reader wants to get involved or initiate a new project, I encourage you to contact somebody there or in Corpus Christi. Over the last few years, we've finally started seeing travelers carrying cell phones with American service. These can be found on sale for about 10 times their normal price in Altar and other origin points along the border. This means that when people end up in danger, they call 911 like anybody else, provided that service is available, which varies greatly depending on the sector but is often not the case, a state of affairs that is itself no coincidence. And where there is service, there is still the small matter that not all emergencies are created equal. These calls are profiled based on language and on what cell tower they bounce off of. 
If dispatch suspects that the caller is crossing the border, then the call is routed to a special border patrol line, which nobody ever picks up. I'm not exaggerating. If you doubt me, gentle reader, I encourage you to go stand in the middle of the desert, call 911, explain in Spanish that you are lost and in need of help, and see for yourself what happens. For what it's worth, this is completely illegal under a whole raft of American laws. It's as if dispatch would never send an ambulance in response to calls from the inner city in which the caller quote-unquote sounds black. Oh, wait a minute. Still, it happens every day. On some occasions, travelers in distress have called 911, been told that there is not enough information to initiate a search, then called their families, who then called their consulates, who then called us. We then went and found the caller standing at some known point exactly where they said they were. There are actually only a finite number of places with two cattle tanks, one empty and one full, next to three windmills, southeast of a mountain that looks like an elephant, and southwest of one that looks like a camel, and so on. This has happened more than once, despite the fact that the government is capable of using geolocation to triangulate cell phones, and we are not, along with other obvious differences in the scale of resources available to our network and that of the state. The Crossing Now that I've set out some of the context, I'll summarize how the crossing goes in Sonora. I doubt if it's much different in Tamaulipas. People arrive in Altar, or Matamoros, Reynosa, Agua Prieta, Nogales, Caborca, Sonoita, Mexicali, and the mafias divide them up into groups. Groups of 7 to 15 people are pretty common. There are often two guides. Sometimes, as I said, the mafia will send the migrants and the marijuana down the same routes. There are advantages to this. It allows them to use groups as diversions. Migrants might be a diversion for marijuana, or a smaller group might be a diversion for a larger one. The Mafia has a million tricks. They're good at this. They'll hand Border Patrol a group today for a favor tomorrow. There's always a possibility that any particular group may be set up for a fall. There are also times when they keep the groups separate. Marijuana is sent into the more rugged routes, migrants into less rugged ones. This is the best case scenario. However the traffic is organized, someone has to keep an eye on the big picture. There might be nine different groups heading out from Altar on any given day, with various others at different stages in the field. Somebody has to make sure that all these people aren't tripping over each other, or that if they are, it's for some purpose. And they're off. What happens next could be portrayed by a simple flowchart. Once a person sets out, there are three possible outcomes. Arrival, deportation, or death. In the event of arrival, the person remains always at risk of being deported. In the event of deportation, the person may choose to try again. The cycle continues. Every single story is different, but nearly all share similar themes. The group starts walking well inside Mexico. They reach the area of the boundary line. Border Patrol focuses enforcement here. This is a risky time. If nothing goes wrong, the group crosses through and continues north. Some days later, if nothing goes wrong, they reach the northern line of control. Border Patrol focuses enforcement here as well. This is another risky time. If nothing goes wrong, they meet their ride and are driven to a house or ranch somewhere. They are then either held for ransom or transported onward to their destination. Do they arrive? Hopefully. As often as not, something does go wrong in the desert. The traveler is detained by Border Patrol or loses the guide. If the travelers are detained, they are deported or imprisoned and then deported. If they are separated from the guide, it is usually for one of two reasons. The first is that the guide abandons them because they are unable to keep up. They are sick, hurt, or out of shape. The second is that the guide loses them, usually because the border patrol scattered the group. If they lose their guide, they are lost in the endless desert. They either find someone or they die. If they find a sympathetic person, they may still make it, if they are lucky. If they find the Border Patrol, they will be detained. The cycle continues. The border is designed to kill people. The system is not broken. It works.
You've just listened to episode six of No Wall They Can Build, a guide to borders and migration across North America, published by the Crime Think X Workers Collective. Stay tuned next week for episode seven, Designed to Kill, part one, Who Benefits, and The Border Patrol. This audiobook is a production of the X Worker Podcast Collective. You can check us out at crimethink.com slash podcast. To order a print copy of the book, read a free PDF version online, check out the poster that accompanies the book, or to learn more about the anarchist struggle for a world without borders, visit crimethink.com slash borders. To learn more about No More Deaths and solidarity work in the desert along the U.S.-Mexico border, visit nomoredeaths.org.